Hi everyone, welcome to the latest edition of Startup Grind's Founder Series, where we educate our community on highly relevant early stage topics through interviews with founders of our top startup members. Today's goal is easily summarized by the title of the episode, which I'm sure you've read, uh, the pros and cons of raising money from CVCs. My name is Alex Gordon Furs, as hopefully you know, having watched the previous episodes of the series. Uh, I'm the VP of Sales and Startups here at Startup Grind. And my guest today is Say Pike, the founder and CEO of IOTAS. How are you doing, Say? Pretty good. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. Very, very glad to have you. And I'll just give you a quick, a quick introduction. Uh, you've had a, a very impressive uh, background, so I'm looking forward to, to diving in. But just to, to, to give that intro, uh, Say started her career in the 90s in Silicon Valley, where she helped to pioneer smartphones at Palm and later Qualcomm. Uh, and then started a company focusing on smartphones in 2007, just before the iPhone launched. Uh, she sold that company to Ernst & Young and started IOTAS, which is an IoT fleet management company focusing on delivering smart building solutions to developers and owners of large multi-dwelling properties. IOTAS is already in 45 or over 45 different markets in the US and Canada and is managing over 100,000 IoT devices in multiple properties to mitigate risk and damage, reduce labor costs, and attract and retain residents with smart home features. Uh, really, really uh, amazing to see the growth that IOTAS has had, especially since you and I met back in, I think it was a year and a half ago, uh, when you won Growth Founder of the uh, Growth Startup of the Year at our 2019 Global Conference, was it? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> Like so where are you, where are you up from today? Are you, uh, is it Portland today? Portland, Oregon. Yes, and it's very rainy today. Yeah. Yeah, I'm used to that. I'm in Scotland, so pretty much. Yeah. Actually, it's been okay recently. I'm looking at a relatively sunny day today, but it was pouring earlier. I went out for a cold morning walk, which uh, got me re got me ready for the day. <laughs> nice. So. Yeah, it must um, be over there. So, so let's begin, I think, with, with some more context on IOTIS uh, before we dig into, obviously, the, the fundraising and, and CVC side. Um, I'd love, obviously, I've given a kind of overview of IOTIS, but can you summarize neatly what the, the main problem is that you're solving? Yeah, so the main problem that we're solving is really for the multifamily home industry. The multifamily home industry, especially right now, is challenged with um, building automations. Uh, so being able to monitor those buildings, especially during coronavirus, Right, being, when they can't have their staff on site, uh, if there's issues with this with the site, whether there's a leak or there's you know access entry issues or whatnot, that's what we do. We go in and convert these buildings to be truly smart buildings. So we take over access into the buildings, access into the elevators, access into the units for the residents, for uh, prospective guests, right, or tours that they might want to self tour the buildings. And then for also for guest residents and residents themselves and any vendors and maintenance folks that might be coming in to service the building. So that's one aspect of it. But then we also monitor the building as well to make sure that there's no leaks happening, there's nothing like open closed um, and so on and so forth to make sure that there's no humidity mold damage either in, in rainy parts of the world like yours and mine. Um, and so that's kind of what we are really striving for is to make these buildings truly smart and truly um, operationally better, right, for the residents living there as well as for the building owners. And so we typically work with the building owners and we sell our hub into the buildings um, along with an IoT package. And um, I was going to ask you why is now the best time to be to be solving that, but I'd love to ask you with sort of within the context of what's actually happened this year, uh, how, how has uh, the answer to that question evolved is maybe a better way to put it. Yeah, no, in, in the context of this year, what a year we've had. I can't believe it's almost over. Um, so hopefully next year will be better. But in the context of the year we've had, I think the, the uh, main thing is that people are not interacting with other people. So typically what we would be experiencing is that we would work with the operations team on site to provide a better experience for the residents as well as for themselves to like mitigate risk and reduce labor load. But for residents have like, really cool smart home experience in, inside. But now we're kind of more focusing on, okay, now that the onsite team can't be there, what are all the things that we can do 
for the buildings, right? Um, if the onsite team can't be as available and there's less contact. And so typically the leasing folks would like walk somebody through a, you know, a building and show them the common areas and the properties and whatnot. They can't do that anymore. So we do things like self-guided tour, which people can schedule and automatically get a key and uh, a virtual digital key on the mobile phone to get access into it and walk through the building themselves. And then other aspects is like all the amenity spaces are also closed. So the gym, the pool, um, or they're very limited. So being able to monitor um, what, uh, who might be in that space, who might be accessing that space, right? How many people might be in that space um, and whether that is within guidelines of, you know, how many people should be at the pool right now or, at, you know, in the movie area and whatnot. So that's kind of the, some of the stuff that we're doing to help with coronavirus and to help the burden of coronavirus and just ease communication between the um, onsite team as well as the residents. That's awesome. And, and in, the, in the space that you're in, um, you know, who, who are the main competitors, I guess, is the first question. And just secondly to that, how have they, um, how have you observed that they've kind of dealt with the, the changes this year as well? Have they dealt with uh, things in a similar way to you or have you, um, have you sort of seen yourself moving, moving, moving ahead of them uh, over the course of the, the last sort of six to 12 months? Yeah, and I think what's happened is that even since we've spoken, some of our competitors out in the marketplace and we have somewhat um, not diverged, but taken different, slightly different paths, right? Where one company is going very much hardware driven, right? Um, and the, and deciding to go up against like major, huge companies that have been established for hundreds of years, delivering locks to buildings. Um, and so going after that market, other companies are going doubling down and going maybe more uh, on the operation side um, and kind of tightening up their ecosystem where we're really opening up our ecosystem, right? And so for us, our kind of fo core focus since this year and maybe a couple of years past is that I totally respect all of our competitors. I think they're doing amazing things out in the marketplace and it validates our marketplace as well. And we're all slightly doing a little bit different things. But for us, I think our key focus has always been and will always be the user experience. But the user experience now expands to things around internet connectivity as well. And that is where we're seeing like the fundamental thing about IOS and IoT is that the I is internet and you really need internet to have a really spot on solid experience. So some of our competitors are really doubling down on cellular. Um, we're gonna double down on managed Wi-Fi and partnering with uh, really excellent managed Wi-Fi companies and um, rolling out a complete package of like bulk managed Wi-Fi plus IoT. So that's where we're seeing a big difference in how we're going to get over some of the hurdles. So. And you mentioned hardware there as well. I know that you were originally um, kind of skeptical of uh, being in the business of smart home devices for consumers. Uh, obviously, because mm -hmm. renters are a large proportion of the market, uh, they're unlikely to carry those around when they're moving from place yeah. to place. Was it, you know, sort of how early on was it that you realized the most important thing to tap into was building the actual software to empower that market and help renters kind of move in and out of smart homes without having to carry these devices everywhere they're going? By the way, I mean, my background is in mobile technology, right? So with mobile, what, what's really cool about the technology is not so much the hardware, it's the software, right? And when you know, Apple came out, like they blew everything out of the water, Paul included, because really it wasn't about the hard keys, right? That let you type, right? They came out with like a touch, uh, a touch screen keyboard. Everybody's like, whoa, is that gonna fly? Is anybody gonna be able to use that? And da da da. And yes, it worked out. And so it's like, it's really for me, the ability for you to be able to take your phone, when you upgrade your phone, all the content, all your settings and preferences, go from that phone to the next phone that you just upgraded to simply easily. And that's how we see the world is that when you move from place to place to place, all your settings and preferences and your home should follow you from place to place to place, right? And to me, that's so much more interesting than hardware. Hardware is commodity. Hardware is just like a stepping, it's a tool to get you to there, but the hardware is not that interesting. It's all pretty much the same, right? So I think voice interaction is really fascinating right now. 
um, primarily in our system, we I personally use voice uh, to activate our systems, uh, the IDA system, and and then really the software associated with it, where you start integrating with a whole bunch of different um, digital applications and tools out there. That's really fun. Yeah, it's a, it's it's an amazing space, and I, I remember actually the first call that we had um, before the global conference in 2019, I, I, I was kind of blown away, even the first sort of five, 10 minutes hearing about what you were doing and your kind of your approach to it. It's, it's uh, super interesting. And I'm kind of really looking forward to seeing where you guys continue to take it. And I think obviously, um, w coming into the, the, the focus of the episode, um, working with CVCs is such a core part of how you're going to build this strategy out, isn't it? Right. right. Yeah, and I think that goes back to kind of the channel partner strategy that I mentioned, right? Is that um, for IOTAs, we know, and I think this is true for any companies, right? Is, is how big is your market, right? It's like, if your market is huge, are there people already servicing that market? Are there people who already um, have sales force in that market? And can you actually hire as many sales forces already servicing that market, right? And we knew that like, even if we hired like, I don't know, 20 salespeople, we would not be able to compete against some of the corporate uh, established companies that may have 200 salespeople, right? So we would rather capture some of that capacity, that sales capacity with our channel partners, especially the telcos and ISPs who have been servicing the multifamily home industries for decades, right? They've been rolling fiber, broadband, DSL before that, coax before that. And so if they have long, long established relationships with our multifamily customers. They're like, well, why don't we partner with them? And then we're like, oh, why don't we take some money on from them as well? Because it seems like a natural marriage is that they need us, we need them, right? They have the internet, we have the value added services that could go on top of it. So that's really kind of how the whole thing, you know, started the conversation. Yeah. That's a really nice way to to kind of frame it. So, um, and before we get to that, I think it would be good to dive back or dive into your sort of initial fundraising journey as well. So just to, you know, uh, I think you were founded back in 2014, right? And um, as a second time founder, obviously we touched on uh, your previous company, Citizen, a little bit early on. Presumably you were able to use some personal funds to, in the first kind of year or so yeah. before your pre-seed or angel round to, to start IOTIS. Yeah, and so I was really fortunate in that. It's a, I didn't start from uh, with IOTIS like the way I did with Citizen. Citizen was definitely like bootstraps, you know, from scratch and had to grow it organically. With um, IOTIS, because Citizen was doing well, um, it was eight figures, and because it was bootstrapped, I was a co owner with one other partner in the business. I had enough uh, capital to get IOTIS going, right? At least to get it going uh, initially. I still raised money from angels and others um, to kind of validate the position uh, and knew, knew that I would need to raise more money. So really kind of getting that initial angels going, initial seed round going was something kind of crucial for us, right? And so, but yes, was very fortunate in the sense that I, I could uh, get, get it going on my own and had uh, enough network and enough um, people that I needed to bring in to the, to the whole whole thing and, and so what what stage was citizen actually at when you left because i think you left before it was acquired by ernst and young did you so yes, how, yes how was the how did the overlap take place yeah so i placed the ceo at citizen in 2016 um when and i took a board seat at citizen to just kind of monitor it but so citizen was still fairly large growing it was eight, doing eight figures in revenue um, and once I placed the CEO, about a year later, we knew that we wanted to exit it. And so um, we actually exited the, the whole thing. The deal was mostly done in 2017. Uh, 2018 was when we finalized it. So really placed the CEO to kind of make it to the next uh, stage of Citizen, which is to exit it and um, part ways with that first venture. Nice. And, and, and then with IOTAS, obviously, you said in the early days, you um, used some personal funds and then raised um, a sort of pre-seed or angel round. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you then raised a, a safe in 2015, uh, followed by a seed round in 2017. I'd love if you could just kind of summarize the, um, 
who you who was involved in the kind of early 2015 round and then moving into the 2017 round how uh, what was your story for that round uh, from iotis as a company yeah so uh, when we first started i think one of the things that was interesting to me is that uh, portland market is a very small market uh compared to where i'm you know originally from silicon valley and, and in the la area and so everybody knew everybody um, every, and everybody was well connected to everybody. And so it was really easy to get introduced into some of the smaller seed players. And in the Portland market, because there's not a lot of capital, it is really some of the smaller seed startups um, uh, funding, right? It's really early stage funding is what I mean. Um, and so getting to know the Portland Seed Fund, for example, the, the groups in Portland Seed Fund was kind of crucial. And it was, they were the first kind of institutional money in to the company. Um, along with that, we, so we did a, a, a convertible round using a safe note. Um, and so they came in and then eventually we went for our actual price round with Oregon Venture Fund, which was at the time called Oregon Angel Fund. And because they were leading the round and their name was Oregon Angel Fund, by the way, um, a lot of the other VCs didn't want to join the round. They're like, we don't want to join a, a, a price round with an angel fund. So I was actually uh, pushing them to change the name and they actually changed the name to Oregon Venture Fund now. Um, and and just, just as an aside for all of your listeners, like, yeah, it, it, is, it is a really weird thing where uh, institutional VCs will not follow angel funds if they think that the name or, or the, the way that it's structured is not um, what, what they're used to. So, but, so that's, uh, that became, became a price point. All the convertible notes went into that round from this, uh, what I would call the angel round into the seed round with Oregon Bank Venture Fund. Nice, and, and so um, what was the, the product story at, at, at the seed round stage? Like how, what stage was IOTIS at as a company after sort of three years of, of development? Oh yeah, we had great product market fit. Um, so we used a lot of the initial angel round and convertible, uh, the money raised from the convertible notes to um, the safe notes to essentially push product market fit to get into as many uh, regions as possible to really prove out the, the product, right? Um, I would say at the, there's two part, uh, parts of this. Where the product was, the product was still in its infancy. It still needed, it, you know, we developed it fast, we got it out to market fast. It, it, it was now transitioning to where it needed to become stabilized um, and uh, reliable, right? Like, like utility in some sense. And then on the actual market side and the sales side, we were growing, we were growing fast. We we're growing like 400, 400% year over year, which is what a normal, you know, small stage startup should be doing. And so we had strong product market fit um, going into it, a good level of growth, um, as well as the product really needed um, a big overhaul, but the product itself was delivering on all the things that we promised to deliver on. So I think that's one of the key things for us when we raised our series C, which you know some would consider series A, it was a uh, 3.5 million uh, around. And so uh, I wouldn't say it, was, it wasn't, uh, it was easy to raise that round because the idea of IoT and multifamily and real estate is just like, doesn't the, add up for a lot of people. But, um, or was that something that had uh, traditional, I guess, uh, uh, you know, VCs going after it because it wasn't, I don't know, FinTech or Bitcoin at the time, <laughs> which was like blockchain or whatever technology. Um, but at the same time, it was a very proven product. And what were some of the, the signals that, you know, if you were saying the, the product had a long way to go at that stage, but you, you had, you know, strong indication of product market fit, what were some of the signals that were kind of giving you that? that feedback? Yeah, so uh, sales. Sales definitely was kind of giving us that feedback that people were, were interested and willing to sign up. Um, and then really seeing kind of like the, the development of it are around the multifamily area. So multifamily started really touting this as like the next new amenity. So there's a lot of um, um, marketing that multifamily was doing on its own, right? Trying to understand what we were delivering into the market. And then on top of that, you know, a year, two years in, all of a sudden we had all these competitors <laughs> pop out of the woodworks as well. 
thinking that this was really easy. I'm like, no, IoT, hardware, anything hard that touches hardware is hard. And so we've had a lot of competitors throughout the years that have come and gone and such. But um, definitely, it's I think really sales numbers are the only things that really drive it, right? So revenue. Yeah, and and I see you raised your first corporate round in late 2017, uh, which was mm -hmm. Intel Capital coming on board, and by 2019 you then brought on two more corporates uh, with I think it was 8.5, yeah, 8.5 raise by Intel and Telus Capital uh, with involvement from Liberty Global. So had you actually actively sought out discussions with those CVCs beforehand, or you know had it been part of your strategy all along to kind of build those relationships and tap them up at the right time or did they sort of come out of nowhere uh, if, if we can say it like that a, a little bit of both right i think with intel intel has a very strong presence in portland um so in the so they have a very large headquarter out here eleven thousand folks or so out here and so i have been working with intel um closely when i was at citizen right so i knew that intel was very active with, and intel would be such a name brand to uh, put into <laughs> around with us, put on our cap table, right? And so Intel then introduced us to a bunch of other corporate bases. So that's how I met Telus and Liberty Global was that actually when Intel came in first, Intel has this um, similar to Startup Mind, but for its own, you know, just CEOs and portfolio companies, a fairly large summit of CEOs and CVCs that meet and they go on a speed date. Um, for like two or three days. And we met Telus that way, Liberty Global that way, and it worked out spectacularly well. And it made, and I met just out of, um, just as a aside, I met everyone from like the energy sector to the internet connectivity sector to the hardware sector um, to kind of like the appliances sector. But I, I, again, going back to my background in mobile and telco, I always knew that that mobile and telco was going to be vital, like crucial for us, right? Um, and so it was really exciting when they got it too. Like when I met with Telus and when I met with Liberty Global, Liberty Global is large in Virgin Media in the UK and, and so on. And Telus is one of the largest uh, Canadian operators. Like it just was kismet, right? And when they understood it, I was like, thank God, thank God they understand what, what I'm trying to deliver here. <laughs> So, yeah, but so yes, it was a little bit of both. I knew that that's who I wanted to target. I just didn't know who would get it. Yeah, and obviously there's an element of um, I don't know. I, I, I want to say fortune in the in the sense that you 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 obviously knew Intel and the connection mm -hmm. there helped you. But yeah. beyond that, they had a platform for you to meet other people. So it you know just for the benefit of anyone who's watching who maybe doesn't feel like they have that platform but they feel like they've got a value you know uh, or um, you know a product that may you know be good to um partner with 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 cvcs to kind of uh, over the course of their journey what would you recommend for people who don't necessarily have that platform available uh, in terms of kind of getting in touch with the right corporates that they want to to work with yeah, um, so that's a great question. I think one of the things that I would recommend is talking to the business development group, first and foremost, like the business development or the sales side, uh, if they don't have that platform, because sales teams are always, always kind of looking for new revenue methods, right, or ways to get better, you know, return on uh, and, and increase their gross margins and whatnot, right? And so if there is something on the corporate side where you have a product that makes sense for that corporate uh, partner to be able to resell, sales team is typically your fastest way in, right? Because no matter what, the corporate VC, depending on how closely tied together they are, or maybe they're not. Um, uh, so I'll take one example, like a closely tied VC will just be like, okay, go talk to the product team. Or go talk to my, you know, the sales executive here. And then once I validate you through the product team or the sales team, then I'll think about investing. So just bypass that step in the first place. Like go to the sales or the product team, depending on where you are in your product life cycle first. And then say, hey, can you make an introduction if you're, uh, if you're interested in partnering working with um, whatever, the, the fund, the VC fund. So that's kind of when the two 
two entities are tied very well, closely together. Then you have others that are kind of like more like Intel model or um, I want to say like Comcast model, but, uh, where they're really just separate, where they think of themselves truly as a financial uh, institution, a, a fund that is really driving financial returns versus corporate gains. Like there's there's got to be some ties to the corporate but, uh, side of it, but they don't care as much. And so if you, for some reason, want to take on a, a CVC that you just need their money, <laughs> right? I'll, I'll be brutally honest about this. If you just need their money, but you see that there are some ties into uh, that world eventually, then understand that. Understand that, that some CVCs are uh, just another financial institution is looking for financial gains uh, and returns versus having it be closely tied together. And so really understand who you're talking to before you're gonna approach them. And so if you're looking at a particular corporate, understand that they're, that they're gonna turn you away until they get through product or sales, or that they might talk to you because they don't need product or sales to make that investment. Just, just understand the dynamics of that um, corporation. And so would you recommend, um, obviously the standard kind of cold outreach approach, uh, Obviously, intros where where necessary or where possible. If you have connections, presumably ha having used those yourself, you'd recommend that. But outside of that, what kind of um, gatherings or communities or events would you maybe recommend that people look out for, or or where do you think that they could find those um, in order to try and get that that same semblance of, uh, you know, the, the the speed dating thing you talked about the the, the Intel Capital um, event. Where, where could people sort of look for a, a similar type of way to engage with these people? Obviously, Startup Grind is one. <laughs> it's a, there are some really good ones at Startup Grind as well that I met. Um, but also outside of that would be um, industry events, right? So there's always industry events. If you're targeting, let's say, telco, there's, uh, there's a, what is that? Like, uh, there's Connections Conference. Um, there's a bunch of other industry events that are like, very specific to telcos. If you're targeting energy uh, sector, there's definitely uh, events that are targeted at energy sector, right? So, and, and those conferences, when we used to have conferences, real conferences, the booths are usually manned by, or, or you know, monitored by uh, sales and product folks, right? So that's a great way to be able to make that initial intro and just be able to, <laughs> this is sad, shake someone's hand and like talk to them face to face for a minute makes a difference, right? I mean, personally, I have uh, raised a lot of money at CES, right? Where I was at the startup alley at CES and people were just turning through uh, um, and, you know, people have given me money on the spot kind of thing, like $50,000 checks on the spot. So like show up, it's, it's, it's a hustle. And it's not just like, hey, I'm gonna shoot out some emails and uh, hope that money will come my way. You're hustling. You're 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 trying to show up. And in the world of coronavirus, it's a little easier because you just attend as many webinars and side chat rooms as possible, right? Just hustle, get it done. Yeah, I love that. I definitely agree there. Um, but th thanks for that. And so, just coming uh, a little bit back into the the round itself, what was the was the process of closing the Series A with the the, the CVZs actually different from previous rounds? Um. I would say it was a little easier. <laughs> uh, they knew exactly what they're looking for. Um, and so they also really need, and, so, and as a you know, first time being a, uh, how to get it funded, right? Versus bootstrap. Like I didn't quite know how to present the books. I didn't have a CFO at the time, right? but they would give me all the material that they wanted. It was a lot, like the, the technical due diligence is, is not, um, is, it's not insane, but it is a lot, right? And they're very organized about it, very professional. And like, I need exactly this back from you. And then they're like, they come, and I would give them that information. Like, you didn't quite do it the way we would want you to do it for us to go in and pitch it. So just oh, one other, other point about that. So they do have these committees and gates that they have to go through. But, they're, they're, but what I like about that process is that they tell you exactly how many committees and gates that they have to get through. Um, I have to, so for Intel, I believe it was like four meetings that they had to get through. 
and when those meetings are gonna happen and, and whether or not there was a yes or no after each gate. So what I liked about that is that there was um, somewhat of a, a level of assurance of like, you're gonna get a yes or a no by a certain date versus sometimes with non-corporate VCs, you're doing this dance for a bit, right? We're like, is this gonna happen? Is this not gonna happen? When am I finally gonna get the no? When am I get, finally gonna get the yes, right? What are, what are your decision criteria? How am I gonna get there, right? And so I think it was a little bit more formulaic, which I liked um, versus some of the other kind of processes that I've been through. And so that's, that's probably the biggest difference is that I thought it was a little bit easier from an emotional perspective, I guess, right? Of knowing what's gonna happen when. Yeah, and the, you know the, the the time pressure in those early days is 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 so heavy that I mean it's always yeah. heavy, but it's especially heavy in those early days. So having that, you know, that structure, uh, I can imagine really helps. Um, mm -hmm. And and so you've be, you've been working with Intel now for obviously maybe two and a half years or so. Um, Telus and, and and Liberty slightly um, slightly less, but how how have they been as 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 actual kind of investors? Um, you know, have they been more active? Um, has your product tra strategy changed as, as a result of kind of working more closely with them? Maybe your commercial strategy. I'd love to dig into to some of that. Yeah, no, they've been amazing. Um, and I'm not just saying that because they're investors and they're on my board. They're, they've, I think if you can really work with a CBC and know that, that your, your strategy involves them, right, and your success involves them, um, they've been just amazing to work with in the, in the sense that, uh, so would tell us um, the person that they put on the board is not from the venture group. The person that they put on the board is the president of security and automation. And, and we are the only board he serves on, right? So the amount of time that he gives, and he has very limited time, the amount of time and dedication he gives um, and support he gives to making sure that we succeed as a company um, is, is tremendous. And they do a clear divide between like the fund versus the commercial side. So he's focusing on making us commercially successful within and outside of Telus, right? Um, and same with Liberty. It's the same kind of deal that the person sitting on the board right now is from the venture group, right? And has lots of experience there, but really trying to understand how we can be commercially su successful is their number one goal. And so and because they understand the industry that we're targeting so well um, and kind of the nuances of working in this channel partner, like large corporate uh, telcos and ISPs, they know how to maneuver us. And also they have the network connection to, um, to essentially put us in touch with different groups within those organizations that make it so much better. So in some sense, like, you know, I, I count myself really, really lucky to have them on my on my team and on, on the board. But I, I think from I would I would say like if you can do it and if you really have a really strong alignment with the corporate group, it is it's so tremendously helpful, right? So I'd go for it if, you, if, if possible. And uh, you know, you may not be able to go into a huge amount of detail here, but obviously, just to kind of balance things out, what what are have there been any kind of unforeseen challenges of working with um, maybe any of the specific individual VCs or a combination of them? Uh, I'd love to to hear any stories you've got on that. Yeah, I think the biggest probably challenge is when you're going into uh, working with a commercial uh, partner or a channel partner and they're an investor in you as well, um, but you're selling still directly to the market, right? you kind of come across like, hey, who owns that customer, right? So that's probably the biggest challenge. It's not so much a challenge around the product, product development because the reason why they're working with you is because you obviously have something that they don't have, right? And they, and they may try to pull you in a direction, but you gotta be really like crystal clear about your own company's boundaries and what you will do and won't do. And if you have a very good sense of like, here's where our vision is and we're not gonna do this, that product, Everybody talks about, oh, corporate VCs, they make you focus on like things that your, your company doesn't want to focus on. I'm like, then don't. Just tell them no, right? Um, and set it and be very clear about it. But I think the bigger challenge actually is on the commercial like, revenue side where how do you 
uh, work with those CDCs or your corporate partners and say, actually, that customer, that customer is mine, right, versus yours. Um, that's probably the biggest challenge that we're going up against right now. I'm trying to uh, be very uh, uh, succinct about that and, and the opportunities there and how to like, carve those opportunities out, right? Because eventually what we want success to be successful is for all those customers to be theirs and that we re generate our revenue through them, through our channel partners. Um, like licensing or technology to them. That's what we care about. But until that moment, you still have a sales force that you're operating. You're still trying to bring market share. Um, and so you can't quite wait for your corporate partners to capture the market share for you at times, right? You just kind of have to like go and do it. So that's probably the biggest challenge. Nice, and you've talked quite a lot about the separation or the importance of recognizing uh, the separation between the sort of financial units and the commercial units of the, the corporates that you're working with or, or looking to work with. What are some of the, the signals that um, there could be some red flags there? If someone's kind of approaching a corporate or a corporate's approaching them, what would someone, you know, look out for ahead of time to kind of understand the, the sort of the way that those two units would work together once uh, once funding you. Oh, good question. Um, well, wow, that's a really good question because there's things that I could bounce off of my board member, but I still have to do financial reporting to my <clears throat> uh, venture group, right? Um, and there's certain things that I I tell my board member that I don't tell to tell the financial group and 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 such. Uh, so that's a really good question. How to watch out for the red flags? I think the the main thing I do prefer, and maybe this is because of my personal experience on this, is that kind of what I would call like the Chinese wall or the wall, a clear wall and division between the corporate yeah. versus the commercial. Um, because if if they're too closely tied together then the, the money gets convoluted, the, the investment gets convoluted in your overall commercial direction, right? I think the commercial teams are better aligned in some ways as they're trying to make a sale. You know, they want to grow their revenue as well. They want exactly what they want, which is growth, right? Um, and I'm not saying that, that when the money and, and commercial unit is that closely tied together, that that's not what they want either. It's just that I think they get convoluted where there's too much crosstalk between the two groups, right? And that would probably be the thing that worries me the most is that you want kind of, um, yeah, how to put it, let's say if things are not going well, right? When things are not going well, that commercial group will understand that you have to kind of hunker down and come up with a potentially new strategy or new product, mm -hmm. which will maybe put you into a hole for a quarter or two quarters, right? And so for the commercial group understands that, the venture group on the other side is like, I need to see regular growth year, you know, quarter over quarter. What's yeah. happening here, right? And um, but if there's like not this, this, there's no wall between the two, then it can get really uh, messy put it that way, right? But if you have a clear wall between the two, then and the commercial group is supporting you, and then the financial group is supporting you a different way, then they can at least have some level of crosstalk. But the commercial group can back you and explain why you might have to take those. Um, strategic shifts yeah and you and you've you've obviously mentioned uh from a commercial capacity you know the the, the sales side is is so key with these these cbc relationships so are there any tips specific to that that you could give you know industry agnostic tips um for the benefit of anyone who's not in the iot world uh to help others get get the most out of their their cbc relationships oh gosh yeah so um I would, my big tip now that having gone through it is definitely get somebody who's commercial on the board, on the commercial side, not just the venture group. Initially, I went in thinking that I only wanted the venture partners that have been working with very closely to close a deal for three months. And you know, you build a relationship um, and they're like, no, we're gonna put a complete stranger on the board, but they're coming from the uh, commercial side um, and the operation side and I'm like, uh, well, I haven't met this person. Are you sure? Like, how's this going to go? But now, in hindsight, brilliant on their part. 
right, uh, to do it that way. Um, because then they can really help uh, get you within the, the machine of the corporation. Like, so the venture group, they don't own the machine of the actual corporation, right? If you really want that partnership and you want that commercial return from that, uh, from that investment through sales and sales growth, like you really need somebody who on your board is not from the venture group. And, and sort of building on that, um, you know, you're at, uh, you raised your, uh, was it your Series A in 2019? So that's when they, they came on board. So moving forward from here, um, how, what does, what does, a, what does a, you know, a fundraising and commercial strategy look like when you've got three corporates on board, uh, you're, you're raising future rounds, how would it look if you prospectively were going to bring on another corporate with that, you know, how would you think about that decision and, and how would you potentially work with the other CBCs to kind of pull that round together? Sure. And so I think uh, the next round we are looking at um, either a true growth venture, right? A growth venture group, uh, because you're right, it gets a little bit crowded around the table um, when you have too many corporates that are of the same ilk, right? So that would be the other thing that we would look at is like maybe corporate groups that are different, right? Or in different markets. So that's the nice thing about TELUS and Liberty Global is that they're not in the same market, right? So um, it helps for us to, with Liberty Global to go to Europe, with TELUS to go to Canada. Um, uh, we don't have a corporate group in the U.S., and we did that in, originally intentionally. That doesn't mean that we won't take them on if they're the right kind of corporate partner, right? Um, and so, because the, the last thing you want to do is like uh, isolate or, or, or el eliminate yourselves from working with other corporate groups that um, because you took on corporate money from one one particular company. And so, but we, we won't say, we wouldn't say no, but we are looking at more traditional growth venture funds at this point for our next round. Okay. And, and it, it sounds like, you know, kind of coming, coming towards the close here that you've had a, obviously an overwhelmingly positive experience so far. Uh, and, you know, obviously that's why, one of the main reasons why we're, we're doing this podcast, because you've got really interesting insights into it all. But mm -hmm. have you, and this is slightly off agenda, uh, have you engaged with other founders who have had a completely different experience and and maybe what what are some of the things that they found troubles with uh in a, in a sort of similar world yeah i have um I, and i think i think some of that is um navigating the corporations right some of that may be the size that they took the corporations on as well so i think too early is is hard uh, because you're just learning about your business. What I think is the difference between us and and um, the corporations that took our money, or I'm sorry, not took our money, took us on um, and we raised from, is the fact that we are very much having gone, you know, 2019, sort of like, you know, four or five years and we launched a product in 2015. So four years in, we understood the market, we understood from like, uh, soup to nuts, like what would make a successful product launch, right? Every time or project launch or whatever it is. And they are learning from us, right? Like they didn't have that inherent knowledge base. So they're learning from us. They're kind of letting us take the lead on those conversations. If you're so early and you don't know how to deploy into, uh, a, and what I mean by that is like all the sales enablement, all the customer care support, all the operational uh, uh, efficiencies and such, and you're so early on, you take on corporate ventures, then I could see how you're getting pulled apart by the corporate ventures going, try this, try that, or, you know, do something else. Um, and so that could be uh, where I see maybe the, some of the problems from the companies that I know and other uh, founders I know who might have taken on money and were just not happy. And also just, you also need to understand how that particular corporation works. Again, my background is mobile and telco. So I know in some ways how to work inside those organizations, right? And, and how long certain things take and how slow they are. But you somewhat, 
use that to your advantage too, right? If you know um, enough about what makes them slow, what makes them move faster, et cetera. If you don't have that knowledge, it's going to be hard. It, it is going to be hard. Um, so learn, I would say learn as much as you can about them. And maybe wait a little bit until you're more established and, and well thought through before you take on a CBC. Well, thanks, Say. And, and you know, obviously we've, we've been through a lot of different um, areas of the, the relationship that you've had with these investors through the last sort of 45 minutes or so. But if there were a single thing that you'd like uh, those watching to take from the, the story today, how would you encapsulate that? Oh boy, I would say one of the things that I would, uh, as a big takeaway is that CBCs may actually be a little bit more savvy um, than some of the newer funds, right? That, uh, that are getting established across the board. I mean, if you think about some of the CBCs like Intel, they are actually one of the most active um, portfolios and globally, like they invest globally uh, uh, on in several different sectors. So they are such an active fund. They are so kind of professional and savvy about what they're investing in, how they're investing and what they expect as returns. And so in some sense, like CVCs might actually be, um, have a larger footprint of portfolios uh, and, and are just are maybe better suited to funding because they also have uh, not, I wouldn't say an unlimited fund, that's not what I'm saying here, but they do have access to a lot of capital. So their pockets are deeper as well, where certain uh, venture groups, they may be at 50 million, 100 million fund in fund one, fund two, and that's all they have. And so they have to reserve for follow on rounds, et cetera, et cetera. Where CVCs, um, I'm not saying that they don't have those limitations, but they have slightly different limitations, right? So they need to uh, give you a bridge and they, you have a good cause for a reason for a bridge, they'll get there. They'll, they'll give that to you as well, right? And so I think that's one of the things that for me, I've, I've learned a lot working with these CVCs is that, hey, actually, this might actually be a better route to go for certain companies. I'm not saying for all companies, but for certain companies, um, if enterprise is your strategy, uh, B2B is your strategy, CVCs are super, super savvy. They are not this like clunky thing, you know, that, that, that don't know what they're doing. They, they've been doing it for a lot longer with a lot more companies typically nice so be op be open to it basically do your do your research uh do your diligence think about your approach uh i think you said always kind of look at reaching out to sales and, and product people first and then you know once you've sort of proved yourself with there you can ask for the referral into into the investment side uh and then hopefully once you're in there manage the relationship well um be strong on your strategy uh, and uh, kind of push back where you think it's not necessarily aligning with uh, what they want you to do. And um, hopefully you can have a successful relationship like you guys have had, have had with uh, yours. Yeah, that was a great summary, <laughs> to put it better myself. I, I, I love these sessions. I, I learn a lot. And uh, obviously, hopefully everyone, everyone watching has as well. I'm incredibly conscious that I'm, it's getting darker and darker outside. I'm in the north of Scotland and I, I literally look like there's a ghost about to kind of, emerge from the darkness and my lighting's not great i need to get one of your uh one of your lights but um yeah yeah <laughs> i've uh, i've really enjoyed today um as always say fascinating speaking to you uh, thank you so much for joining for giving us your time and uh, good luck over the next few months i'm sure we'll we'll chat again soon sounds good thank you alex Speak thank soon. you very much bye bye